Admiral, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. And what an inspiring video that was. Hum tayar hain. Hum kitne tayar hain? Let me begin by asking you that question. How well are we prepared? It's a. It's not a very difficult question to ask uh, armed force because if we are not prepared, I think we are out of business. So I would say that the Navy is combat ready, credible, cohesive and future proof. Uh, all our effort is to ensure that we uh, protect, preserve and promote our maritime interests in the, of the government of, of our country. Uh, we do this through uh, being prepared, ensuring that our units are combat ready, uh, the crew is worked up, uh, people are you know, well trained and professionally sound and uh, we deploy our assets also uh, in a planned manner. We have something called the uh, mission based deployments so that they are forward deployed and whenever our assets are deployed they are fully combat ready. That means uh, they are able to uh, undertake a wide range of missions. Normally uh, the roles uh, cover uh, four different aspects that is uh, combat, uh, diplomatic role, constabulary role and benign role that is in case of any HADR requirements or non-combatant evacuation operations, etc., or low-end tasks like uh, you know uh, patrolling and uh, keeping policing sort of tasks as, as well. So the, whenever we deploy a ship or a, any asset, it it is fully capable of meeting the entire spectrum of operations. So so that they are present in the in the uh, in the forward locations and uh, they are able to uh, respond with alacrity to any uh, challenge which emerges. So in our region, we hope to be a first responder whenever there is a challenge. An example I would say is the, the recent uh, evacuation of uh, internationals from Port Sudan. Uh, our ships were there, uh, just outside the port, waiting for you know, clearance to go in and uh, we started the evacuation along with the Air Force aircraft which came in. So, uh, so being forward deployed has its advantages of being able to respond to challenges. So we also uh, uh, try to be the preferred security partner of the nations in, in the region, in the Indian Ocean region. So whenever there's a crisis, we are able to you know, come to their help uh, you know, provide assistance. The recent cyclone which happened in uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, we were able to send four ships with relief uh, equipment cyclone mocha. So, uh, so that speaks of the uh, level of preparedness that we ensure uh, on a uh, daily basis. Well, that's fantastic. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the Agnipath scheme. I began talking about that also with the Air Chief who was here just a few moments ago. It's coming up to a year now. Admiral, in August 2022, the Indian Navy received 9.55 lakh applications under the scheme. Also, very importantly, 82,200 women aspirants applied to it. What is your assessment of the progress and what is the aim really of the force with these Agni Veers? Uh, I don't know whether you're aware, but uh, I'm one of the uh, few officers who've been involved with this Agni Veer scheme right from the time you know, people thought about the scheme. Uh, this is, I would say, way back uh, in uh, 2020, uh, when I was the uh, Vice Chief of Defense Staff with uh, General Rawat. So that is the time this uh, uh, Agni, Agnipath scheme was being, uh, you know, thought of at the very basic stages, and uh, it went through various iterations, a lot of discussions with the services. Uh, there were naysayers, you know, some were for, for it, against it, and so on. So finally, uh, uh, when the decision was taken to implement it, and you know, the firm shape was given to this uh, scheme. 
uh, I was lucky to be in this uh, in the chair as the chief of naval staff, and uh, uh, the Navy fully supported the scheme. We were very clear that this is the way to go, uh, and I'm very fond of saying that uh, Aknipath. If you look at it as an acronym, I think it uh, speaks for itself. Okay, the first A stands for uh, Azadi Ka Amrut Kal scheme. That means a scheme for the future, for your next, you know, as you transit the next 25 years, this is a scheme for you. G, it's a growth-oriented scheme. It will provide you a lot of, uh, uh, you know, qualified people for industry and, uh, you know, the rest of the nation whenever the, uh, they finish their service and join. Uh, and for a nationalistic scheme, you know, it will, it generates uh, fervor, uh, to serve, to put on the uniform and to contribute. Uh, what is the difference? Earlier also there were people who wanted to serve, but now the opportunities are much more. Earlier you, we used to induct about 3,000 uh, personnel in a year. Now uh, as, the, as you progress, we will be able to take almost three times, uh, three and a half to four times the number every year. So the, there are opportunities for more people to serve maybe for shorter durations. So that is the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, nationalistic and nation buildings part of it. And I, I would say in Agni that is for uh, greater uh, uh, interaction with the uh, civil population. That is, there is going to be greater, you know, um, interaction between the, the military and the uh, civil society, which is what we want. We, we want the uh, both to be integrated better. Uh, as of today, we have six and, uh, representation in the Navy from 656 districts. Uh, but the vision of the national leadership is to have uh, an Agnivir from every block and subsequently an Agnivir from every village. But that is true integration of the armed forces with the civil society. Okay, and uh, when you talk of the other four, P A T H, P you know, a patriotic scheme, those you know, patriotic fervor, then uh, uh, A, it's an Atmanurbar scheme. That means a scheme for India, made in India, made for India, made for us. Similar schemes are there in various other countries, but it's a scheme for us. T, I would say, is a transformation. It's a transformative scheme. It's going to transform the armed forces. You'll see that uh, we have uh, an average age profile of about uh, 32 as of now. Uh, it is going to come down drastically. It will come down to somewhere around 25, 26, or maybe even 24 over a period of time. So uh, it's a transformative scheme. And the last H, I would say, is a, you know, it's a uh, harnessing of the human resources of a country where we are enjoying the uh, the... Um, youth dividend and uh, therefore it's an opportunity for us to harness the more you know tech savvy uh, youngsters and uh, it's a win-win I would say for both for the armed forces as well as for the nation. Well that's interesting I never heard that you could sort of spin this into an acronym and then elaborate on it that's a nice way of sort of putting it out there but several questions have been raised on this scheme and I think you're quite aware of some of the concerns how do you address these concerns that battle readiness will be sort of found wanting, military bond, among other things, because sort of, you know, forces are coming in, forces are going out. How, does you, how do you build a cohesive unit, a cohesive fighting force? Yeah, these were questions which have been raised over a period of time. I mean, I've been hearing it from the time we, uh, we have uh, voiced our... Uh, support for the scheme and how to take it forward. Uh, but I think most of it is misplaced and uh, I would say misinformed. Uh, firstly, uh, there is really no change in the training. There were apprehensions that the, no, the training is going to be uh, cut down and the people will be ill-trained and all that. I think that's just, uh, uh, you know, it's a figment of imagination, I would say. Even before the scheme, any trainee who joins the armed forces, he goes through a, a basic recruit training. And the recruit training is varies between, in the services between 16 weeks to 18 weeks, maybe, you know, 19, 20 weeks. Uh, all that has happened in this case is uh, to reduce it marginally by a couple of weeks. 
and uh, how do you ensure that the training quality doesn't suffer through uh, more, you know, through better training, uh, training processes, uh, through, uh, you know, uh, greater involvement, uh, use of uh, simulators and cutting down certain subjects which have probably uh, outgrown their utility and so on. And after the recruit training, they go on for professional training. The professional training is for another about four to five months, depending upon the trade that he, uh, he takes up, whether he's a mechanician, electrician, uh, or whether he's a, he's a uh, gunnery rating or anti-submarine warfare rating, etc. So they uh, go for uh, training, which now hardly any change has been brought in in that. Now, after this first, I would say, uh, you know, uh, recruit training as well as the professional training, there is no other training which is given even today till uh, that sailor uh, completes about six years of service. So, by the time we talk of the next level of training, uh, we, he's already crossed the, you know, the four-year mark. So, whoever is being retained, we are going to continue the training. So, that is as far as the training part is concerned. Uh, there have been a lot of issues raised about, you know, cohesion within the unit. But let me tell you, in the Navy, uh, we serve in different ships. It's not that we remain on the same ship for years together. So we serve on a ship for, uh, you know, a year or two years at best, and then we move on to another ship. There is no, and that is a pattern which is followed in all navies. So there is no question of, uh, you know, uh, any lack of cohesion. I would say there are two aspects to cohesion. When you talk of uh, social cohesion, when you talk of uh, task cohesion. Uh, social cohesion perhaps may require, you know, uh, being together for a certain amount of time, etc. But when you talk of task cohesion, it is the type of work you do, the involvement of the team, how much of, you know, difficulty, hardships that you face together, what are the challenges, and the sense of, you know, belongingness that comes in. So, uh, in, a, in a ship, uh, you know, the moment you join, you are, you are part of the team and it is the, uh, the motivation that comes in along with that. So, uh, I have served in so many ships and we keep shifting from one ship to another. So, it doesn't take much time to be part of the team and, you know, be cohesive enough. So, uh, many of these are, uh, are just viewed or aired by various people who, uh, who are not really fully, uh, I would say, uh, informed about the... Uh, 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 Do you think they have a benefits. motivated interest? Pardon me? Do you think they have a motivated interest to try and continue with the status quo? I would say, you know, the, uh, there's a saying by Little Hart, Captain Basil Little Hart. He was the, he was the strategist uh, who retired from the armed forces. He said that the only thing more difficult to take out from the mind of a military man or a military mind, uh, uh, you know, only thing more difficult to, than putting in a new idea into a military mind is to take out an old one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that is, that is the challenge. So many people find it very difficult to think uh, differently. Out of the box. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, of course, there are motivated interests, there are a lot of people who are running academies for, you know, induction into service, etc. They all have their own, you know, viewpoints, etc. But uh, when you look at being progressive and uh, being in line with what is happening all over the world and how to, you know, uh, uh, look at the aspirations mm -hmm. of uh, uh, youth, then I think this is the way ahead. So let's talk a little bit about Atma Nirbharta. Uh, you had referred to it in your acronym. Um, when will we be import free? You sort of said it, or the government has set a target for 2047. Are we on track? And how far down the road are we? Because that's not very far away, to be honest. See, uh, the government has set the 2047 as a time to become a developed nation. Uh, we as a Navy, uh, we have taken a commitment or, on ourselves to be a Admandurbar Navy by 2047. Uh, can we achieve it? We will certainly strive to uh, in that direction. What are the challenges? Uh, you know, we've started uh, making our own ships from uh, 1960s onwards. The first ship was Ajay, which was commissioned in 61, 62. And since then, we've been building 
bigger and bigger ships. We moved on to, uh, that was just a patrol boat. From there we moved on to corvettes, to landing ships, uh, tanks, uh, to the Nilgiri class frigates, to corvettes, to, you know, uh, destroyers, uh, tankers, and uh, finally now the aircraft carrier Vikram. So we have come a long way over a period of time. Now, when you build a ship, there are, you know, three aspects to it. One is called the, the float component, second is called the move component, and third is called the fight component. So in float component, uh, we are at well above 95%. That is, the steel is made in India. We have uh, made our own steel, DMR 249 Alpha and Bravo. The steel was, steel was uh, uh, developed in India by DRDO, Midani Labs, uh, by uh, the Navy and SAIL. In fact, now we have gone on to the new uh, uh, version of that, uh, DMR-301 as well, which is used for submarines for greater depth and so on. So all ships, submarines hereafter, the steel will be 100% made in India. So the hull part of it is completely, you know, will be made here. Uh, we don't have to import steel at all. Uh, the, when you talk of the uh, move component, uh, we are somewhere around 65 percent, I would say, because we are yet to make uh, marine diesel engines of the requisite capability, you know, the, uh, or a gas turbine, uh, marine gas turbine, or for electric propulsion. But we are on the way now. Uh, because all the other things like shafting, you know, propellers, uh, uh, the control panels, all those things are being made in India now, there's no problem. Uh, stabilizers and so on. So only uh, issues we face with these, uh, these engines and we have already gone on to make these uh, in India. There's a make uh, one project which has been initiated. Uh, there, is, there are plenty of uh, takers in the industry and uh, this is being uh, pursued. So we are hopeful that in about four to maybe six, seven years time, we'll have our own engines which we can, you know, uh, thereafter use in our ships. Uh, the third component, of course, is the fight component, which means uh, the radars, the fire control system, the, the computer, fire control computers, the uh, combat management system, and the weapons, and so on. Uh, in that, we are somewhere around 55 percent. We make our own guns, we make our own ammunition, we make, uh, uh, we make um, the uh, torpedoes, we make torpedo tubes, uh, rocket launchers, rockets, etc. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, more complicated, you know, guided weapons like the SAM systems, etc., uh, we, are, we have some way to go. So therefore that is the area of focus and we are quite sure that we will probably, you know, reach a fairly high level of Atmanur uh, Bharda and that. And, uh, the idea is that the key components definitely should be made in India. Rest, whatever is available, otherwise commercially off the shelf, etc. So that, uh, you know, it's not a challenge. That's good to hear. Let's talk a little bit about the Indian Ocean region. And I was just speaking with a colleague of mine, uh, Vinay, just before we came in. And he said that while we are so focused on our western and northern borders, the real challenge now lies perhaps in projecting power uh, into the sea, because that's where perhaps today uh, most of our trade flows in, most of our communication lines are based, etc. And that perhaps is the area that we really need to be fortifying. So in the context of that, I want to talk a little bit about Sagar. In 2015, the Prime Minister unveiled the Sagar policy for enhancing capacities to safeguard land and maritime territories and interests. Uh, what are the challenges in this theater for the Indian Navy to be a net security provider? I would say, you know, we, uh, this was a term which was used earlier, but we have mo now moved away from that to uh, a term called the preferred security partner. Uh, I would explain as to why we are being, you know, talking of being a preferred security partner. Uh, because uh, we have to engage with all the countries in the, in the region. Uh, there are you know, big countries, small countries, you know, with different levels of capability. Now, all the problems in the challenges in the maritime domain, they are not unique to any one country. Most of them are transnational, you know. Uh, leave the, uh, the traditional, you know, state-on-state uh, -state conflict as one part of it. But when you look at all the other aspects, whether it is IUU fishing, whether it is uh, 
uh, you know, uh, illegal migration, uh, the transshipment of drugs, arms, uh, terrorism, etc. It is transnational. It cannot be solved by any one country alone. You have to, you know, have partnerships. You have because the oceans are vast, and uh, you need a continued presence there. Uh, and therefore, you need to engage with all of them. Some have uh, very limited, uh, you know, uh, resources. So therefore, when you partner sh partner with them, we look at, you know, three four things. We look at uh, uh, capacity building, capability development, training. Uh, exercises, uh, interoperability, and so on. Uh, why do we pursue this regularly? So that uh, we, uh, you know, develop trust. You know, trust is something which cannot be uh, searched overnight. It it has to be very patiently built. So with all our countries in the in the in the region, whether you look at the Maldives, the, you know, Sri Lanka. Uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, Comoros, uh, Mozambique, uh, 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 Mombasa, you know, uh, Myanmar, so many uh, of the countries in the region, we engage with all of them, you know, at regular intervals. Uh, there are exercises, bilateral exercises, multilateral exercises, uh, uh, maritime partnership, uh, you know, uh, exercises, yes. uh, joint patrols, uh, so many things. And we help them, you know, reciprocal visits, training, all that. Well. In April 2023, you said that there's a large presence of Chinese vessels in the IOR, in the Indian Ocean region, and the situation is concerning. Now, why is it concerning in the immediate, number one? And how does the Chinese presence create the potential for future conflicts in this region, and what could be the impact? The... Uh uh, Indian Ocean has, or has uh, historically had, you know, a presence of extra-regional forces. Uh, at any point of time, you have up to 60 extra-regional, you know, uh, units, naval units present here. Since 2008, we have had the presence of the, the Chinese uh, Navy, uh, which has been here for anti-piracy missions, and since then, uh, also, we have the Chinese research vessels, a large number of Chinese uh, fishing boats, and so on. So, uh, when we when we, uh, we look at it from the point of you know of the, for Navy, our idea is to ensure that the the uh, region the, at the sea remains uh, safe, uh, secure, and uh, uh, free, open, inclusive and uh, uh, available for all of us to use and benefit from it. It's a, uh, it's a, I would say, uh, a common, it's a global common. So uh, we have to uh, keep it secure and safe. So uh, as we see the increased, uh, you know, presence, uh, we, uh, uh, we develop our plans uh, which translates into acquisition of capabilities, whether it is in terms of, you know, increased numbers of assets, etc. Uh, so uh, the uh, area is kept under surveillance. We have uh, the uh, PHIs, the uh, Sea Guardian, uh, uh, RPAs, and uh, uh, other ships, submarines, etc. We regularly, you know, patrol and keep those things. So uh, as our country uh, also, you know, grows. Now we are already the fifth largest economy. Hopefully by next year we will right. become the fourth largest or so. And as you move up in our uh, economy, our dependence on the sea is going to only increase. Because whatever you make in, in the country, uh, you have to export it. How do you send it out? You know, the uh, trade by sea remains the most efficient. When you compare, you know, uh, road, rail and sea transport, it's in a scale of 1 is to 10 is to 100. Absolutely. That is the type of efficiency that is uh, and, there. And that's why it's, it's such a vulnerability. And, and I just want to ask you this. Um, how committed are the Chinese to expanding in the IOR? What is your assessment? Uh, see, uh, uh, let me tell you uh, this. Uh, if you remember the words of Mahan, uh, Admiral Mahan, you know, the great naval strategist, what he said is, uh, you know, the need for a, for a Navy arises from the need for peaceful shipping and disappears with it. So what does this mean? This means as your economy grows and as you have, you know, greater trade, as you have more ships, uh, peaceful ships or trading ships, then your, naturally your need for a Navy also grows. So which is what we are seeing. 
uh, as the Chinese uh, economy grew and uh, you know their uh, trade increased, as the ships increased, therefore the Navy is also grown. Now, as we move up, you know, into a larger and larger economy, when we cross the, you know, uh, become a five trillion economy and, you know, grow bigger, you will also find that, you know, our, uh, you know, the maritime uh, forces will need to uh, grow uh, along with it to ensure that our trade or interests which are there in the maritime domain remain uh, safe and secure. So, uh, uh, when we develop a navy, it's not looking at any particular nation or, uh, you know, the type of, we don't go into a bean counting sort of a situation. We look at where our interests lie. Our interests may lie uh, in various places in the ocean. So, do we, we need to have the capability to ensure that our interests are, you know, protected. So, so let me ask you my final question, Admiral Saab. Aircraft carriers, there's a big debate. How many, how many do you think we need, really, to secure ourselves? Or should we go with um, the late general's formula, the CDS, who said perhaps our dependability on uh, aircraft carriers is not in tune with our strategic interest? This is a debate which is, uh, it is never ending because very, uh, various people have various views on, you know, where uh, is an aircraft carrier required or not required. I would only, uh, you know, tell you to just look at who all have built aircraft carriers. And, you know, China uh, has now, you know, already building the third aircraft carrier and, uh, you know, looking at more. They had a plan for as many as ten. Uh, you look at all the UK after doing away with aircraft carriers, not, not gone on to have two aircraft carriers. So, uh, an aircraft carrier brings with it certain capabilities which nobody else can replicate, okay? Whether it is power projection, whether it is continued, you know, uh, uh, air defense. Uh, a shore-based aircraft can only give you limited, you know, uh, ability of uh, air defense. If you want 24-7 air defense, say 2,000 miles or 3,000 miles away from land, then you have to have an integral, uh, you know, air element which is, can be born only on a sea. So, therefore, the, the, the uh, combat capability and the power projection, the sea controllability, the so many uh, 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 things which are unique to a carrier uh, uh, cannot be replicated elsewhere. Therefore, you know, uh, it's a question of affordability, how many carriers you need to have. But I'm confident that as the nation becomes, uh, you know, richer and richer and becomes, we become a more developed uh, nation, we move on to perhaps the Sec the second or the third or the fourth largest economy, uh, our trade interests and maritime interests will grow, and therefore, our, you know, the the budgets automatically will you know be able to handle the requirements. So we shouldn't put a number on it. You, you're saying yeah. that don't cap it at any number. Absolutely. Go with what you can afford. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Admiral, speaking to you, and I'm sure that uh, our audience has enjoyed this conversation because it's given you a certain idea of where we are and where we need to be with regards to projecting our blue water strength. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.